My name is uh, uh, Delphine Moretti, and uh, I am the IMF Regional Advisor for Southeast Asia on Public Financial Management. Uh, I've been asked to uh, be a panelist during this session, but also to moderate it. And uh, uh, therefore, before starting my, uh, my presentation, I would like to remind you of the session's format and uh, objectives. So concerning the objectives, um, as you know, today's session will focus on uh, discussing opportunities and challenges associated with green budgeting and green bond issuance uh, to promote climate sensitive policies in Asia and the Pacific. And uh, the questions that will guide our discussion today are uh, what are the key green budgeting tools uh, that countries can utilize during the conceptualization and implementation of their green recovery plans? Uh, can green budgeting or PFM practices help create fiscal space and mobilize additional resources? What is the role for uh, sovereign green bonds during a time of high debt to GDP ratios? And are there possibilities for regional cooperation in green bond issuance or synergies which uh, countries can exploit to improve their green uh, budgeting or PFM approaches? So that's a very uh, large and uh, interesting program for, for uh, the next hour and a half. And uh, for discussing these uh, topics, we have uh, uh, today five panelists uh, joining the discussion. Uh, including myself, as I just mentioned. Uh, I will maybe ask the, the, the panelists if uh, they can to switch on their video so that participants can visualize uh, who they are. Uh, so first, I see uh, Jan Blondal, who is the head of division uh, of the uh, public management and uh, budgeting division in the uh, governance directorate of the OECD and also the editor in chief of the OECD Journal of uh, Budgeting. Uh, welcome, uh, Jan. <laughs> uh, and uh, I know Jan very well. We've been working together, still work together. Um, uh, there is also uh, Mrs. Margot Lelon, uh, who is also uh, from the OECD. I don't know if I see Margot. She's a policy analyst and, and was uh, prior to that uh, budget officer at the French Ministry of Finance, where she took part in uh, the uh, implementation of uh, green budgeting uh, for the, the state uh, budget. Uh, we have also uh, today with us Mrs. Paola Alvarez, uh, who is the spokesperson uh, of uh, Secretary uh, of the Department of Finance and Assistant Secretary for Communications for Special Concerns and for Disaster Risk Financing and Climate Change in the Philippines in the Department of uh, Finance. Uh, among our main tasks are the oversight on the content for uh, the communications of the department and creation of insurance products and uh, other disaster risk and climate mitigating financing uh, instruments. Um, and the, the final, uh, the, the fifth panelist is uh, Mr. Ki Kirtisri uh, VG Vera, a senior economist who has extensive uh, experience in uh, working in Asia and internationally, uh, both for the private and the public sectors. He has worked uh, with uh, several development agencies such as the UNDP, the IMF, the World Bank and the ADB, and uh, is an expert on uh, macroeconomic management, public financial management, development policy, sustainable investment and national development plans and uh, financing. Um, so now concerning the, the format for, for this session, uh, as I just said, it will last one hour and a half. First, there will be four presentations delivered by the panelists. And uh, after these presentations, a uh, panel discussion will conclude this, uh, this session. To facilitate uh, this panel discussion, I very much encourage participants to submit their questions as they arise during the panelist presentations uh, using the chat function. Uh, and uh, you are, of course, also welcome to ask additional questions during the panel uh, discussion itself. 
Um, I will also ask you to make sure that you are muted during the, the presentations and, uh, and panel discussions unless you are, you are speaking. And uh, with this, I thank you for, for your attention and for joining us uh, today for this interesting session. And uh, I hope we will have a lively uh, panel discussion. So I think I, I start the uh, presentations uh, and I'm going to share my slides. Um, so I hope you can see my slides. OK, I assume uh, if that was not the case, someone would have told me. So uh, switching now from the moderator role to the presenter role. Uh, let me say a few words uh, about uh, why mainstreaming climate change into uh, public financial uh, and investment management is important and uh, what uh, the IMF has learned so far and how it can uh, be done. So uh, first, why is it important to talk about Green PFM in a workshop dedicated to the role of fiscal policies in a green recovery? Uh, although many countries are still uh, battling the, the pandemic, uh, the development and even in some cases delivery of uh, recovery programs is, as you all know, uh, high already on the agendas of governments that also have to deal with the fiscal legacy of the pandemic uh, that is elevated uh, debt levels and reduced uh, fiscal space. And uh, these recovery programs are perceived in many countries as a unique opportunity to also decisively advance policies that will help meeting international commitments on climate change and uh, the environment. So uh, in this pretty much decisive moment, there are many things that governments need to get right. Uh, they need to get right their fiscal policies in light of their international commitments and national objectives. And I know this is discussed during uh, the other sessions of the workshop, uh, where uh, there will be uh, panel sessions on carbon taxation, uh, reform of energy subsidies and, and so on. But they also need to get right the prioritization of these policies, their funding and their implementation. And uh, this can be achieved only with sound public financial management, that is with sound fiscal institutions and processes to underlie the formulation of the policies, the allocation of resources to these policies and availability of funds for their actual implementation, as well, of course, as accountability over the results achieved. So concretely, uh, what countries uh, need now is not only good PFM, but uh, green PFM. And what uh, green PFM implies is the integration of an environment uh, or climate sensitive perspective into each step of the budget cycle and across the whole of government with the objective to make budgetary uh, decision making systematically and equally responsive to environmental and climate and fiscal concerns, the three uh, concerns. And, and finally, and this is a very uh, important point in the context of today's discussion, uh, green PFM can also provide credibility to governments that engage into green bond issuance uh, because investors in green bonds expect that they will fund expenditures and projects that are rigorously selected uh, and also seriously and timely implemented and accounting for uh, with transparency and green PFM uh, practices where they are well implemented will provide uh, the building blocks uh, for all this. Now, uh, what is uh, concretely uh, green PFM? Uh, green PFM is a notion uh, akin to uh, green budgeting, but has a wider scope as uh, it explicitly considers uh, public financial management functions that might go beyond the scope of the budget formulation and execution per se, such as, uh, for example, the coordination with local governments and state-owned enterprise or uh, public investment management. 
Uh, one of the questions that was asked to the panel ahead of today's session is what are the key tools that countries can use for the development and implementation of their green recovery plans? And uh, it's a difficult question because there are many good tools uh, that can be used, but the short answer is that uh, the best ones for a given country will depend on its uh, existing PFM framework and what are its strongest budget institution and potential resources and capacity constraints. So within this framework that you can see uh, on the slide uh, that is mentioning a series of tools, each country uh, will have uh, to pick uh, what is the most uh, appropriate for them to advance uh, their green uh, PFM practices. I want to insist here on the fact that green PFM does not require a novel approach to PFM, but is rather an adaptation of existing PFM processes and tools. Uh, for example, countries that have successful experience in implementing performance budgeting, SDG budgeting or gender budgeting will obviously have a stronger starting point although they will still need to develop the methodologies and the tools that are specific to climate and environment policies for implementing uh, green uh, PFM. In terms of where to start, uh, there are two obvious entry points, uh, which are the planning and, and budget formulation stages of the budget cycle. And specifically, uh, as you know, the planning stage consists in defining a national development uh, strategy and reconcile this strategy with overall uh, resourcing constraints. This will often take uh, the form of a medium, uh, medium term fiscal framework uh, outlining the main macroeconomic assumptions and the macro fiscal ba baseline. And this is where actually uh, green priorities, concerns uh, and, and uh, objectives, both on the revenue and the expenditure side, should be incorporated uh, at this early stage, uh, notably uh, with respect to the content of the overall development plan or strategy, the identification of high level mitigation and adaptation targets, the management of transition risks, and the definition of the macroeconomic scenario. Here, uh, I would like uh, to say that green PFM cannot be expected systematically to generate fiscal space for spending on new green initiatives, but it can reasonably be expected to help prioritizing and reallocated resources within a given country's uh, existing fiscal space or constraints in a way that is consistent with its commitments on climate and the environment, which is the reason why it's important to have this green uh, perspective at the fiscal planning stage of the budget cycle. Uh, the, the budget preparation phase is similarly crucial uh, for the inclusion of green priorities and concerns. Uh, for example, all ministries for the preparation of their budget submissions may be instructed to estimate both the cost and climate impact of new policies using, for instance, uh, for instance, a consistent set of assumptions on carbon dioxide prices. They can be also asked to put forward investment projects that are meeting new environmental and climate related criteria. These are just examples of how uh, budget procedures can be adapted to allow uh, the Ministry of Finance and Cabinet to factor in systematically environmental concerns in budget decisions. I could uh, go on and on uh, on this topic and talk about the, the other tools, but having uh, only uh, 10 minutes, I will, uh, I will uh, stop here. Um, because I want also to uh, have the time to say a few words about public investment management, uh, which is a subset of public financial management. Uh, because as you know, uh, climate change and natural disasters are already creating very significant needs for infrastructure investment in the region, uh, which uh, have been estimated at around 9% of the regional annual GDP over the next 15 years by the IMF for Asia and the Pacific. And this is the reason why uh, the IMF considers that countries need to develop quickly the tools and capacities to integrate climate consideration in their public investment management frameworks. 
And uh, building on its pre-existing public investment management assessment, uh, the, the PIMA tool, uh, which was developed in, uh, in 2015 to help countries in uh, evaluating the strengths and weaknesses of their infrastructure governance at each stage of the public investment cycle. The IMF has recently uh, developed a new module to assess how climate change considerations are factored into uh, each key stage of the public investment management uh, framework in a given country and develop recommendations where existing practices are below uh, the desirable uh, standards. You can see on the right uh, side of these slides uh, the uh, fifth, the five uh, stages of the public investment management uh, processes where uh, the IMF is uh, uh, proposing uh, to integrate uh, climate change uh, consideration. To conclude this presentation, uh, I would just like to underline first that uh, although green PFM may appear ambitious and complex, it is not a PFM revolution. It is uh, really about adapting existing practices to make them more climate sensitive, and this is an achievable uh, objective for most countries. Uh, it is really our belief at the IMF that virtually all countries can integrate at least some aspects of a green PFM framework into the national practices. And uh, uh, although there are no or maybe more accurately few examples of countries that have a comprehensive framework, uh, many countries of the region have successfully started implemented uh, green PFM some of which already a decade ago, like Bangladesh, with the support of our UNDP uh, colleagues. Indonesia and the Philippines have uh, also developed and used for several years uh, fairly sophisticated tools, for, example, for instance, for tagging their green expenditures. And uh, the two countries uh, are in the process of uh, scaling up their, their efforts. So uh, there is a lot of uh, good practices to, to be found in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, this final slide uh, is just to emphasize that the IMF uh, is supporting these worldwide efforts. Our surveillance work is, not, uh, system, uh, is now systematically including a dialogue uh, with countries on climate change and environment strategies of the uh, government. We, we also have capacity development and technical assistance activities on request with our member countries. Uh, including uh, recent pilots on the climate change module of the PIMA. One was done in, in Nepal and uh, we also started uh, assisting countries uh, with developing uh, green uh, PFM uh, uh, and um, uh, climate sensitive budgeting uh, practices. Um, I also want to uh, mention that there will be a soon a regional seminar organized uh, by us for Asia and the Pacific that will get uh, more in-depth into many of the topics that are only uh, very briefly touched upon uh, today and in particular uh, that will discuss the role uh, of the ministries of finance in supporting uh, the effort for addressing climate change in Asia. I stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So I think it's now uh, Margot and uh, Anion uh, that are going to, uh, to present green budgeting, uh, the green budgeting framework yes, of the OECD. Thank you, Margot. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, okay, yes. perfect, thank you, because I had some problem before. Yeah, I will share my slide to you. Okay. So thank you, Delphine, and good afternoon to everyone. So my name is Margot Lelon. I am policy analyst at the OECD and specialized in green budgeting, I was previously deputy head of office at the budget directorate of the French Ministry of Economic Finance. And this presentation will focus on practical ways and benefits in which country can use green budgeting to implement stimulus packages that support a green recovery. So 
the pandemic has renewed the attention on how country can achieve long term sustainability and resilience. And many Asia Pacific economies are preparing longer term recovery packages in response to the COVID-19 and which has provided opportunities to include green dimensions to the package of initiatives. And this inclusion allows to support green recovery with new budget options and measures linked with green national and international objectives. So what we have to keep in mind is that green recovery will require concerted policy action. And as countries consider recovery packages, there are opportunity to prioritize green policy choices that help to promote climate objectives, to speed up structural change toward the low carbon transition, but also to increase society resilience to future shocks and also to reduce future risks. So what is green budgeting? As we know, like green budgeting describes the integration of environmental and climate criteria into the budget cycle to enable decision makers to understand and guide budgetary choices. Thus, green budgeting improves budgetary steering and currents with environmental objectives, and it strengthens the transparency of expenditure management for parliaments, civil society and citizens, and it promotes the development of the skills of the public administration with new knowledge and practices. And if we have a look at the practice, for example, more than a third of OEC countries practice some form of green budgeting. So the OECD framework is composed of four building blocks, and as you can see, it, it's like complementary of uh, what Delphine presents before, because each block ensures that the approaches are linked to the budget process. Like firstly, a strong strategic framework should provide information on climate objective with clear institutional arrangement for the leadership of green budgeting. Secondly, the green budgeting tools and methods should align with climate objectives contained in the framework. And thirdly, the efforts to promote accountability and transparency should help to ensure its credibility. Because stakeholders such as like Parliament and other other third institutions, like for example IFIs or a super audit institution, can play an important role in scrutinizing the information to ensure that government doing an effective is doing green budgeting in an effective way. And lastly, the enabling environment to ensure the implementation of green budgeting results. So this may include capacity development, program, and performance-based budgeting also. So how green budgeting can support a green recovery? Developing green budgeting, new and adapting tools help support recovery, for example, by identifying green priorities and budget options. Indeed, to be effective, green budgeting should be supported by high level political commitment and administrative guidance. And a strong strategic framework will outline national objectives, practices, systems, and that are responsive to climate concerns. And in this way, the strategic framework can be used to help direct resources toward the strategic priorities. And within the areas of governmental expenditure, a range of methods are available to governments to help to plan, analyze, or evaluate, review policy proposal from a green governance perspective. For example, green budgeting tools include like impact assessment, cost benefit analysis, green budget tagging, green spending reviews, and green evaluation. So, and more recent developments include like bringing a climate perspective to macro fiscal forecasting, and it will incorporate climate impact that can inform the preparation of the fiscal strategy and the budget. So, the trajectory specified should be really consistent with the findings of that sustainability analysis, which will cover the effect and risk related to climate, and it can include also scenario analysis. And this will help identify ways to fund mitigation and adaptation reforms in the public sector, and it will also inform like policymakers in the implementation of risk mitigation and measures and permit to update fiscal risk management framework, for example. And Malaysia is one of the examples of, which, uh, of a country which are prepared uh, macroeconomic modeling. And finally, to support green recovery, countries can use tools to provide like summary information on all recovery measures aligned with the country's green objective. 
for example, a green a general green budget statement, but also a green progress statement or a distributional impact analysis. So to facilitate the implementation of green budgeting, countries should integrate it into the budget cycle by different ways. So if we look at this diagram, which shows it very well, we can see that during each phase of the budget cycle, specific public policy objectives must be attached. And under those objectives, specific concrete elements must be defined with different tools, which can be like complementary, as we can see on the line below, because we can have like excellent impact assessment, program mandatory, tagging, and export performance. So, uh, how can green budgeting process help to create fiscal space? As we know, a number of Asian Pacific and OECD countries attach green conditionality in relation to support measures to help green economy recovery packages. So green budgeting will help countries to firstly identify funding options within an area of government or transfer. And we can use to do green spending reviews. We can green spending reviews is a useful tool for expenditure prioritization and it helps to assess the estimate of positive and negative impacts of public sector expenditure. It helps to identify funding options or transfers to coordinate also decisions across governments and to elaborate uh, new decisions de uh, between departments to, to access also expertise and advice and to maintain transparency. So the integration of green perspective into the medium and longer term budgetary framework is really important because it's likely to help country to embed environmental policy alongside consideration for fiscal sustainability. Green budgeting also helps to prioritize investment that support low carbon recovery, and it can become a precondition for public and private investment alongside considerations of efficiency and effectiveness. And it really needs to be aligned with decarbonization objective. And finally, countries can also use green tax policy as a strong revenue raising component because carbon pricing should be a core tool of the green tax policy framework. It provides a technology neutral case for low carbon investment and consumption, reinforcing green stimulus. It can also help to restore public finances by augmenting tax revenues and raises the cost of carbon intensive assets. And it will steer investment and consumption resulting from non-greening stimulus in favor of low carbon alternatives. So at the end, increasing carbon pricing should be gradual over time. So if we there have been like many emerging green budgeting best practices in the region from some year. For example, in Indonesia, with the green planning and budgeting strategy uh, in Philippines too. Uh, we, where the government uh, publishes the people climate budget, which inform the public on the findings from the tagging exercise. Also in Thailand, uh, which has started a recent project to allocate and use this public finance effectively and efficiently to achieve its objective on climate change and green growth, as well as the SDGs. So, what role for Turban Green Bonds, which is another tool, indeed. We can see that green bonds are really growing and rapidly in number with a very strong uptick in the first half of 2021. It's not a new instrument, but it became like it's growing. And green bond has really become an important source of revenue for governments to finance their recoveries, like in Bhutan, in China with clean coal, carbon capture, in Indonesia, Philippines with geothermal power, in Thailand with solar energy, for example. But from a debt management perspective, issuing a new instrument will help to enhance the financing capacity of sovereign and to diversify their funding sources. In addition, green bonds feature broader benefits to the overall economy and the financial market by supporting government's efforts in financing the low carbon transition and also promoting the development of a domestic market for green bonds. So to conclude, the COVID-19 has led governments to implement unprecedented fiscal and budget policy action, and those efforts are likely to continue through significant stimulus packages that aim to place Asian Pacific countries on a path to sustainable social and economic recovery. So governments have an opportunity to green recovery packages to speed up structural change 
throughout the low carbon transition. And green budgeting can help to facilitate this implementation. A well-designed tax policy also reinforces green stimulus and additionally aligns traditional forms of stimulus with decarbonization objectives. And a well-communicated spending and tax policy choices will benefit in well-being, environmental protection and resilience. So if you are interested in these topics and our work, the OECD has published like several recent papers on green budgeting. They may help you in your green budgeting practices. And please also feel free to visit our website or to contact us. And I really thank you for your time and attention. I give the floor back to Delphine. Thank you very much, uh, Margot, for the presentation. Um, I am now handing over uh, to our third presenter. Mr. Vijay Vera. Hi, um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, uh, good afternoon uh, to colleagues and uh, good up, good morning to uh, colleagues who are joining on the other end of the uh, globe. Uh, thank you so much. And let me see if I can just share my presentation with you. Uh, Uh, I'm sorry, do I have access to share my screen? Uh, I uh, We see you, but we don't see your slides yet. Uh, do, do. Um, you, you should have access to share your screen. Can you try? Yeah, I'm trying that. Um, just... Did you remove your... Um, yes, you, you stopped the sharing, Margot. Okay, sorry. It's just loading now. I have uh, sent the uh, presentation to Himanshu uh, and, and Finn. I'm not sure whether they have received it, uh, sent it early in the morning today. Uh, if you're in a position to kind of load this, uh, it'll be great. Otherwise, I will try, I'll try from this end. Yes, maybe our colleagues can show the slides for you. Finn, okay. do you have the slide? Great. Yes. Yes, please, Finn. Yes, please, Finn, if you can just put it up on the uh, slides and I can just uh, ask you to scroll it uh, if you go along, if you don't mind. I just need to open the presentation one second. All right, thank you very much, Finn. Uh, so, again, uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Uh, okay, um, slideshow, just sorry. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, 
and uh, you can go to the next slide. So uh, I have uh, basically coming in uh, after having uh, speak to De Daphne and also Margot, uh, who covered quite a lot in terms of the public finance management aspects of green, green budgeting and green, uh, green, green, green recovery. Uh, we at the UNDP, uh, we are very concerned about the, the specific uh, connotations of uh, the green PFM and green recoveries to biodiversity. And that's indeed is going to be something that I will be focusing on in my presentation. At the heart of the, uh, the issue is that uh, we are facing globally uh, the aspect of two, uh, two challenges. Uh, one, as we all know, uh, the COVID crisis, uh, which is dilapidating the entire global environment, uh, pushed close to about 100 million back into poverty, reversing almost all of the poverty gains that we have uh, made over the past decade. And also at the same time, uh, we are looking at unprecedented level of uh, ecological degradation, uh, which has been part of the kind of uh, the work that we have been carrying through some of the uh, policies we have pursued in countries. Uh, nearly 1 million species are at risk of extinction. Uh, quite a lot of forest cover have been depleted every year, and the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is rising at, at an alarming rate. And uh, in this context, uh, there's also been the issue about fiscal policies and uh, how various stimulus measures which are given across the countries have helped to kind of address the underlying situation. But unfortunately, according to the Global Recovery Observatory, only about a fifth of that spending uh, fiscal spending has have had some positive green characteristics, and even uh, even in that, uh, there has been extremely quite very negligible amounts going into biodiversity and and conservation of nature. So these are the kind of the overall shako of uh, challenges uh, that we are looking at in, in today's context. Uh, next slide, please. Finn. So when we uh, Look at these these challenges. Uh, the UNDP has been supporting countries uh, across the globe, uh, almost in uh, presence in 170 countries, and been working in one of the most challenging and uh, in fragile uh, environments, uh, trying to turn uh, this uh, situation into into some sort of a recovery better uh, and recovery stronger kind of modality. Uh, primarily through, uh, through the effects of uh, financing, turning, uh, mobilizing resources for uh, challenging the green, green, challenge, green recovery challenge. And also at the same time, looking at means and discussing with the authorities, the policymakers, that the dimensions of uh, building back better, building forward and building back better, which is one of the crucial uh, themes of our UNDP approach. And all in goes to uh, to meet our primary motto of uh, leaving no one behind and uh, principally uh, supporting the achievement of the 2030 targets. Next slide. So within this framework, uh, the UNDP is supporting countries stage green recoveries uh, through uh, four pillars. Uh, these are the standardized four pillars that we are using across our globe in terms of addressing the climate challenge as well as the SDG challenge. So two, two key uh, components of uh, looking at the issues is first of all, looking at the SDGs and the 2030 agenda but also at the same time, the environment and climate challenges and the commitments uh, the countries have made uh, in things like the national development uh, and national uh, cont contribution um, indices and the SDGs. So these are the two pillars in which uh, we are proposing and basically pitching our green recovery framework. Uh, next slide, please. Getting into the, uh, the, the reality of the public finance issues, uh, this is oversimplifying uh, some of the uh, you know, areas that have been covered by the previous two speakers. Uh, but we see the public finance domain for green recovery as composing of uh, three, three pillars. Uh, what could be considered as the expenditure and the revenue measures, uh, the financing measures. Uh, we, we discussed that in the previous two presentations. Uh, but more importantly, that uh, the environment that brings all these two together, uh, that is the public finance management systems. And all these three pillars have very strong connotations to biodiversity, uh, which is in terms of mobilizing resources uh, for biodiversity, conservation, restoration, and also looking at expenditure policies, uh, enabling that uh, same, same purposes of conservation and restoration, and also looking at financing. Uh, for biodiversity and enabling PFM systems uh, that brings the uh, house together. Next slide. So very quickly into uh, what do you mean by by finance? Uh, so next slide. So for those uh, who are not familiar with the biofin approach, uh, this is basically where we are, where we are coming from. 
sorry, just the previous slide, please. Can I please go to the previous slide? Yeah, thank you. So in many countries where we are working in this field, uh, we start off with a very uh, common uh, premise that uh, there is no baseline for us to kind of tag ourselves to. Uh, that is one of the reasons is that because we find it very difficult to figure out exactly how much is spent on biofinance, uh, biodiversity activities. And also at the same time, uh, we also find it difficult to kind of figure out uh, what are the financing gaps which are needed to close the biodiversity challenges in each country. So usually in many countries that we are operating in, uh, these are the kind of core challenges uh, which are which we faced at the outset the the bio uh, the biofin approach uh, try to systematically address uh, these root causes uh, first of all finding out exactly what type of expenditures are going towards biodiversity uh, the biodiversity role in terms of conservation uh, in terms of uh, you know, restoration conservation and uh, preservation and also at the same time, in terms of the national determined contributions, the NDCs and also SDGs, what might be the additional financial requirement, uh, which is needed until 2030 or whatever the time period in the future in order to meet those challenges. So once we get the, the resource requirement and the existing resources uh, through a baseline assessment, uh, then we are able to come up with what we call a financing gap. Uh, which is the required needed resources in order to kind of fulfill the both NDCs and SD. Uh, and there are many ways in which the biofin uh, kind of uh, advocates and also goes uh, implementing some of these uh, gap, uh, gap uh, consolidation measures. Uh, some of them actually looks into looking at the revenue measures. Uh, what are the key revenue measures that can be used for biodiversity conservation? Uh, what are some of the expenditures uh, that can also uh, you know, do the same thing? And also at the same time, how do we can streamline existing expenditures so that we have better, we derive better efficiency out of it and also get better, better results. And also looking at sustainable solutions and sustainable systems so that uh, we will look at uh, addressing some of these uh, challenges in a very holistic and in a sustainable manner so that we do not create uh, follow up issues uh, down the line. So all in all, uh, this is basically what the biofin uh, activities at that country level achieves to do. Uh, if we go to the next slide, the uh, some of the key elements of these assessments uh, are these uh, three three components or three separate assessments that uh, we have put across. Uh, one is the policy and the institutional review, uh, which we do in countries to analyze what are the underlying drivers and policies in countries uh, which are uh, which are helping in biodiversity conservation. Uh, the other important aspect is the biodiversity expenditure reviews, the, uh, you know, the BER, and uh, which actually starts off with exactly finding out what I mentioned earlier in terms of uh, figuring out the baseline, uh, how much is spent currently, and uh, and what are the kind of items, uh, the, 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 the dimensions of spending, both in terms of primary spending, which goes directly into biodiversity activities, and some of the secondary means of spending, uh, which has indirect effect on, on, on biodiversity. Once we have these uh, elements together, we are in a question to uh, uh, articulate what is known as a financial needs assessment, uh, which are the, 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 the gap filling uh, measures that I, I talked about earlier, how much is uh, needed in, in order to reach the uh, biodiversity target. All these three elements feed into what you call a biodiversity financing plan uh, in countries, and uh, which are which which has very high level ownership at that country level. Uh, I'll show that in the next slide, and uh, and also at the same time how it's kind of get integrated within the existing financing structures of a country, you know, to uh, go at uh, you know uh, achieving uh, the, the financing. Uh, next slide, please. All these, uh, of course, comes together with the uh, with the help of a very extensive network of partners uh, that we work with in countries. Uh, in many of these countries, uh, the initiatives are led by the government, so they are owned by the government and they're led by the government, ideally by the Ministry of Finance. Uh, but we also have the, the international development agencies, so the World Bank, the IMF, the UN uh, coming into that. And also at the same time, the private sector and the civil society also plays a major role uh, in bringing this biofin financial strategy together. In some countries that we also have very strong parliamentary support, uh, for example, uh, in, in seashells, uh, the parliament actually approved uh, the biodiversity financing plan. So that is very strong oversight and a commitment from the legislative arm of the governments as well. Uh, for, for, for this. Uh, next slide, please. 
so this is uh, basically a kind of a map of uh, where we are operating across the um, uh, across the globe. Uh, Quartic countries are currently active in biofin. Uh, Twelve of them are regarded as mega uh, mega biodiverse, mega diverse countries, uh, including China and Madagascar. Uh, and uh, we, this has been carried out for, for quite a while, quite a long time now, and uh, it is a very uh, well built uh, machine within the UNDP currently. Uh, next slide, please. So when we uh, talk about the overall public finances, like I said, I will be going through this very, uh, very quickly. Uh, what are the key uh, dimensions of overall public finance, uh, which has strong connotations to biodiversity? And some of these factors are things that actually keeps us awake at night, uh, given that you know the, the situation is, is quite, uh, quite concerning. The first uh, observation is that uh, public sector as a whole globally spends very little on biodiversity. It's just about a quarter percent of global GDP, and that pales in significance compared to the measures taken by government, which we consider as harmful to biodiversity, and that's around 500 billion uh, close to per year. And many of these harmful effects actually uh, stems from uh, few sources, and one of the key sources is the support uh, for fossil fuels. Uh, is one of the largest and the most significant contributors to climate change, as you all know. And uh, and, and being that, it's also the one of the largest contributors for biodiversity loss uh, across the globe. Equally of importance is the, some of the agriculture support measures uh, adopted in countries, particularly targeted on, on, the, on the prices and outputs, uh, which encourages bad farming and agriculture practices, and particularly the high interest use of fertilizers, um, and pesticides, and also uh, you know, and, and other forms of uh, you know, uh, un unsustainable practices. Uh, we also have the concerns in terms of the mar marine uh, biodiversity, uh, particularly some of the fishing practices uh, adopted uh, in various countries, uh, which again are targeted towards the volume, uh, the, the the catch uh, of the of fishing, and uh, which encourages overfishing, and also will at the same time have this very large uh, debilitating factor on the, on the on the on the marine ecosystem. We also have a challenge in terms of capturing relevant data. Uh, this is something that I uh, mentioned earlier when we talked about the baseline. One of the key things of the biofin approach is to carry, ca catch the baseline to figure out exactly at country level how much is spent on uh, biodiversity. Uh, and this is a this is a widespread issue uh, that we still do not have a good handle on how much of public financing is devoted to, to biodiversity. But this situation is improving. As I said, the, uh, the biodiversity expenditure reviews are being carried out in more and more countries, and that helps us to actually close this uh, information gap. Next slide, please. And if you look at some of the uh, key revenue and the expenditure measures uh, which are used to biodiversity, uh, we see that in the uh, in the revenue measures, both the biodiversity taxes and biodiversity levies and fees, which are some of the key uh, revenue sources uh, the government, uh, there has been an incredible proliferation of these instruments uh, across the globe. And uh, currently, there are around, uh, in terms of biodiversity taxes, there are about uh, 206 active instruments across uh, across the globe, and in about 59 countries, and which is fundamentally based on the principle of polluter pays, and and, and uh, taxes which are levied on negative externalities created by uh, the use of natural resources. Uh, equally. Uh, of a similar phenomenon is the biodiversity fees and levies, uh, which is a form of user fees, as you all know, uh, for use of environmental resources, and also penalties for non-compliance, uh, which has also grown quite rapidly over the years, for the last 30, 40 years. Uh, 48 countries are currently carrying out, uh, carrying these things out now uh, with an active portfolio of about 169 instruments. And all these data, of course, comes from the OECD from their buying database. Uh, in terms of expenditures, uh, some of the key expenditure measures we see are the biodiversity subsidies and other forms of fiscal transfers, um, which are actually supporting uh, the nature conservation and environmental uh, you know, preservation across countries. Uh, and also at the same time, in some countries, uh, promoting things like sustainable agriculture, like I mentioned earlier, uh, about those uh, lack of those sustainable agriculture policies is one of the reasons why we are facing quite a lot of biodiversity loss. And uh, some of these resources for these uh, fiscal subsidies and transfers can actually be recouped uh, from the revenue measures, uh, which is uh, outlined at, at the top. Next slide, please. 
Next slide. And what's the other issue uh, we are also concerned about is the uh, the what how the kind of uh, finances for how do we systematically group in finances for biodiversity. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, there is very little spending going on uh, in biodiversity, and one of the reasons is that there may not be sufficient public finances which can be roped into biodiversity approaches. So this is an area that uh, having a lot of focus right now. Uh, how are we kind of mobilize financing resources for uh, for biodiversity? And uh, one of the key areas uh, would be the, uh, the, the thematic debt, debt instruments uh, that we talked about green bonds, uh, but there are other instruments as well, like sustainable green bonds. There are public uh, sector funds which can be used. There are also instruments like the debt furniture swaps and, and of course vast gamut of innovative finances uh, that, that can be brought in. Next slide. Next slide, please. And of all, uh, what, what I said, uh, the BFM systems, uh, which uh, both uh, Daphne and, and, and Marco has just discussed earlier, is, is what brings everything together. It is to bring the entire public finance system together. And we have seen some very strong uh, you know, approaches by countries in order to build in this uh, green BFM, green uh, climate change, uh, change related activities into the public finance realm. And France is one of the key uh, key measures we see that um, uh, that that has actually brought in uh, quite a lot of uh, green PFM in the, in the public finance system. But more importantly, going forward, uh, what what is important is to kind of advocate uh, the role of program based budgeting and also resource based budgeting uh, to promote biodiversity in countries. And Guatemala is one of the countries that we have supported. The UNDP has supported through the Biofin Initiative uh, for resource based budgeting on. on on, uh, on biodiversity. My last slide um, is on. Um, so, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, some of the uh, uh, the some of the publications uh, we have, uh, just like the OECD, uh, Marco presented earlier. Uh, the UNDP also has quite a quite lot of uh, literature and material uh, on 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 this. Uh, there's a central repository of all the information in www.biofin.org that uh, people can make make use of. Uh, but there are lots of documents here out there which outlines the biofin approach and also what it has achieved on the ground. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vijay Vera, for this uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation. Um, I'm now calling the, the last uh, panelist, uh, Mrs. Paola Alvarez, for our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just wait for the presentation to be shared. Uh, I think we sent the presentation earlier. Okay, so I'm not sure if you see my presentation because I. Yes, yes, we can see it. Okay. Yes, we can see it. Uh, okay, so I can't see it on my behalf, but uh, on behalf of the chairperson designate of the Climate Change Commission, Finance Secretary Carlos G. Dominguez, uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to everyone. So, following on the initial discussions on the different uh, policies, and instruments that could be used to address climate impacts will give you a brief run through on how the Philippines actually implements these policies and includes them in monetary and budgetary process. So uh, first slide, please. So before I proceed with our initiatives, let me give you uh, with a short background. So while the Philippines is among the countries with the lowest carbon emissions accounting only for 0.3% of global GHG emissions, it is highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, so especially typhoon. And this is because of the country's archipelagic, archipelagic nature and geographical locations. And this is also why the Philippines has been championing climate justice in our international communications, while at the same time acknowledging that climate and green finance should be both funded through public international finance as well as private international finance in uh, collaboration with other means such as green budgeting that are actually used 
by governments to help distinguish, for example, how much budgetary allocations are already being transferred, for example, for uh, different adaptation and mitigation measures. So next slide, please. So to give you a glimpse, uh, November 2020 alone has shown that the numbers and severity of typhoons passing through the Philippines are becoming greater. So the Philippine typhoon season has actually moved, further disrupting economic and social life in the country. Thus, the threats of climate change, environmental landscapes, and changing consumption patterns aggravate the country's long-standing developmental challenges. And we uh, recognize that huge financial requirements for investments should be mobilized to address climate change and disaster risks. So next slide, please. So in the long run, the Philippines is expected to incur 177 billion pesos, or roughly 3.6 uh, billion US dollars per year in losses to public and private assets due to typhoons and earthquakes. And in the next 50 years, the country has a 40% chance of experiencing a loss exceeding 989 billion pesos or and a 20% chance of experiencing a loss exceeding 1.5 trillion pesos. And this assumption does not take into account the new IPCC report, and we project that these figures would actually increase once we revisit them. And this is precisely the reason why we take climate change and disaster risk mitigation in a spectrum. So we look into the different layers, for example, for insurance strategies that we need to put in place, and we actually tag, uh, we'll, we'll show you later how we use a budget tagging system to, to monitor these um, general appropriated funds towards disaster risk mitigation. But even if we put so much layers of insurance or no matter how much strategies we do in terms of disaster risk mitigation, we still can't let go of the fact that at the same time, since it is a spectrum, you also have to mobilize financing towards the adaptation and mitigation side in order for you to, in the long run, eventually mitigate the costs of damages that we lose, uh, especially because of the increasing and greater number of disasters. So next slide, please. Uh, for the Philippines, the estimated cost to implement climate change mitigation actions for the energy forestry, industry, and transport sectors alone is around 4.12 billion US dollars from 2015 to 2030. And as such, climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction will become an even bigger challenge for the country if natural hazards are less predictable in the future. So next slide, please. So as you may know, the Philippines recently submitted its first nationally determined contribution, and the Philippines is at the forefront of a global movement seeking climate justice and meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. And because of this, our ongoing efforts towards climate change adaptation and mitigation measures in the Philippines through the Climate Change Commission has submitted the country's first NDC with a commitment of a uh, global of GHG emissions reduction and avoidance of 75%, of which 2.71 is unconditional and 72.29 is conditional, representing the country's ambition for greenhouse gas mitigation for the period of 2020 to 2030. Now, with this type of commitment, we have actually come across different arguments saying that it's not ambitious enough. But what the Philippine, especially Department of Finance, wish wants to communicate is that when we look into the integrity or how a NDC submission should be looked at. You need to also consider if it's doable or are the countries, especially those most uh, uh, those most vulnerable to the effects of climate change, do they actually have the policy capabilities or do they already have these policy gap measures that we need to put in place for them to actually fund their NDC commitment? For the Philippines, by using the different um, budgetary tools, we have actually looked into how we actually need to mobilize or that's why the, the reason why it is conditional is because we actually need to mobilize huge amounts of resources just to fund our NDC transition. And given the given that we are sim, we are situated in such a way, we are highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And even if we pour in so much in terms of general appropriations towards disaster risk mitigation, the number or the premium price for insurance every year just increases because our hazards or our exposure to risk hazards such as typhoons and other natural resources are increasing. So even if we mobilize 
around 5% of our GDP towards adaptation, mitigation, disaster risk reduction, it still wouldn't be enough in the long run if we do not mobilize, for example, public international finance or private international finance through the form, for example, of capital market developments in order to fund our other adaptation and mitigation needs. And that is precisely why we wanted to communicate how important sustainable and green financing is in terms of policy. So next slide, please. Okay, so what is the Philippines doing? So we started in 2019 to join the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action. And one of the uh, principles that the Philippines was championing at that time is principle four, which takes into consideration climate change for monetary, uh, monetary policy, fiscal policy, public uh, budget and uh, budget management and actual private investment uh, management or uh, public uh, procurement processes as well. So in order to do this, what we look into is how do we actually um, put in place or how do we implement the policies that we have been talking about? For example, the budget tagging system, how does it help a country like the Philippines? So the purpose of budgeting for us, budget tagging is for us to see how much we've allocated actually internally in terms of general appropriations towards disaster risk mitigation and adaptation for, for climate change, if it's actually enough or how much do we need to increase in these budgetary allocations yearly and how much can we source out, for example, from floating sovereign bonds or how much could we, flow, could we finance through PPP. So it actually aids us in trying to track how do we plan in a long-term strategy way in funding our NDCs. So aside from that, we also focus on adaptation measures. So the government of the Philippines is actually exploring means to achieve climate change mitigation goals through cooperation and partnerships in different international fora. So aside from the Coalition of Finance Ministers, we also participate in the APEC and the ASEAN Technical Working Groups on Disaster Risk Financing and Insurance Strategy. And we have been heading this together with the government of Japan in the ASEAN for as long as, as since 2015. And now I think there are moves in the ASEAN and APEC as well to look into how climate change should also be incorporated in terms of uh, financial instruments and in budgetary um, and other policy processes. So another initiative that we have been doing as a offshoot from the uh, implementation of the different policies uh, concerning the Helsinki principles that aims to, for example, mainstream climate change in terms of the different uh, finance policies and government is the Green Task Force or the Sustainable Finance Interagency Council, which was created through the help of the Prosperity Fund of the UK government, which we have been working in preparation for the COP uh, since 2019 as well. And what we aim to do in this interagency task force is that with the help from the UK government, they, they we actually exchange knowledge and they they've uh, shared with us what were the bottlenecks for mainstreaming green and sustainable finance in the UK. And what we saw is that, for example, in the Philippines, for us to efficiently mobilize climate and sustainable finance or for us to make the policy environment conducive to mobilizing finance towards uh, investments, especially for a green economic recovery, is to mainstream climate change in the different areas of project finance, for example. So this is why it's an interagency council, because you, you need the central bank, you need the energy department, the ministries of environment and other line agencies, which which actually implement government projects related to climate and sustainable finance to come together and sit and to talk about how each uh, department should harmonize their policies, for example. So we look into what are the bottlenecks in terms of banking and in terms of, for example, development of renewable energy projects. What are the bottlenecks in terms of funding these projects? So we aim to mainstream them to harmonize. So uh, we are actually crafting as of the moment the sustainable finance uh, roadmap for the Philippines and this is this will be the first product of the green force aside from the a green taxonomy or the guiding uh, uh, principles towards um, uh, public investments that are related to green and sustainable. And the goal here is for us to mobilize financing, especially through the uh, capital markets towards providing funding for sustainable and green projects for a green recovery. So 
Another initiative we have is a partnership for market readiness with the World Bank, and this actually aims to consider how carbon pricing instruments could be implemented in the Philippines in the long run after we have already secured our energy requirement through your mobilization of green or sustainable financing. So next slide, please. So uh, with the green structure in the Philippines, we focus on the financial instruments that are designed to help the government manage the cost of disasters while at the same time increasing revenue generation. And this takes into account environmental risks and impacts as well as green facilities and solutions to finance programs and projects on environment and natural resources management. So. Other initiatives that are ongoing in the Philippines, so our private uh, banks have also heeded the challenge. So there are banks that have voluntarily adopted sustainability principles and environmental and social risk management in their operations, such as those that you see on your screen. And next slide, please. For the government financial institutions, uh, they also have uh, in place like the Land Bank of the Philippines and Development Bank of the Philippines, which uh, incidentally are also both the uh, direct uh, access entities of the Philippines. Uh, they were recently approved as well by the GCF. So next slide, please. So for the green, the sustainable uh, finance roadmap, so you could see them on this your screen as we have been talking earlier, the goal of this uh, interagency task force is to harmonize or to mobilize financing through policy instruments. So we make it conducive for investors to have direct investments in the Philippines to fund, for example, renewable energy projects. And there are parallel, um, there are parallel initiatives as well from the Department of Energy, as well as both houses of parliament. Uh, they're also moving ways on how to relax economic restrictions in order for us to mobilize green financing at, for, a, for a green recovery. So next slide, please. So as regards the uh, budget tagging in the Philippines, we actively implement climate finance tracking initiatives. And just to name one, we have the National Integrated Climate Change Database and Information Exchange System, which we abbreviate as NICDES, which serves as a primary and even platform for the Climate Change Commission in consolidating and monitoring data and information on climate change and climate action from sources and actors coming from both the public and private sector and other stakeholders. So of course, these are on going and live initiatives and we update them from time to time and we're continuously working with development partners to improve them. So another one is the Philippines has led the development of a standardized climate change typology and coding structure for the use in the planning, budgeting, monitoring and reporting of climate change expenditures. So this is together with our Department of Budget and Management. They have implemented this through a joint memorandum circular and they mandate government agencies to track their climate change expenditures in their respective budget submissions using a common framework, more popularly known as the climate change expenditure tagging. OK, so this, the climate change expenditure, expenditure tagging helps identify financing gaps on different sectors and further facilitate the mobilization of existing climate financing schemes. So an example is, for example, we have the Philippine, uh, the uh, People's Survival Fund in the Philippines. However, we have gaps in financing in the form, for example, of capacity building, because although this funding source within the internal appropriations of the government is available for local governments to access to fund adaptation projects, they still have a hard time developing the feasibility studies and the project preparation process. So through the CCET, then we identify the financing gap. So since we can't afford, for example, to allocate in the internal budget of the government the financing cost for the capacity building, then we would know how much we need in terms of multilateral assistance or what we can provide, what we can include in our uh, policy development loans from multilateral partners, for example. So uh, we also have the um, so they, we also have uh, budget transparency initiatives and we have been developing this as well with the UNDP, for example. Uh, and we have been participating in uh, sharing these uh, policy instruments in other platforms as well to be able to work on them and maybe help improve them through learnings from the uh, information being shared by other uh, countries as well, like uh, so for example, in the APEC or in the ASEAN. So next slide, please. So in terms of green and sustainable bonds, so the total ASEAN, which the Philippines is a member of, labeled green, social, and sustainability bonds, already issued amounts to eight, around 8.58 billion US dollars, 
of which 4.19 billion or 39% were issued by Philippine companies as of 31 March 2021. So this puts us behind Thailand, which accounts for 43% of green bonds and way ahead of our neighbors such as Malaysia and Singapore. So next slide, please. So finally, we are also building the capacity of our local governments for the formulation and implementation of sustainable development projects. So as we said earlier, we're helping capacitate them to deepen their understanding also of how financial markets or the floating of sub sovereign bonds, for example, can help them fund their uh, uh, adaptation mitigation projects while at the same time providing for a green recovery. So these are issues also as well as fiscal uh, prudence and other matters in terms of risk management. These are all included in the capacity building uh, programs that we are preparing for our local government uh, units. So overall, we are striving to make citizens aware that all of us play an important role in the fight against climate change and to stump to jumpstart our program to combat the climate crisis, the DOF or the Department of Finance also supports the movement in Congress for the urgent passage of a measure regulating single use plastics. So we are also working with the World Bank to look into a roadmap to lower our uh, trash pollution, especially since uh, 10, I think, out of the 20 top ocean uh, polluting rivers uh, comes from the Philippines and it is actually because of the plastic problem as well. So we are also, uh, so we want to help people understand that by curbing the use of single use plastics, every Filipino will do for his or her part in helping the country save or mitigate the effects of climate change. So finally, uh, we also have different initiatives with the government of the UK and the ADB in terms of our energy transition. Uh, we are working with the ADB on a co-replacement fund, and this aims to mobilize sustainable or green financing towards transitioning our coal-fired power plants into renewable energy sources. Like, for example, we're going to buy out all the coal-fired uh, power plants, and this is through an ongoing technical assistance with the ADB, but at the same time, we'll also help mobilize investments towards, um, uh, towards, for example, the Angus Polangi hydropower plant in Mindanao, which the Department of Finance aims to increase the energy yield capacity through sustainable and green finance. So these are other initiatives that we think could help us achieve not just our NDC, but also a green recovery from the pandemic. So last slide, please. Okay, so with that, let's be partners for change and I end my presentation, so I'll be here for your questions as well. So thank you and I yield the floor to our hosts. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, very comprehensive and interesting uh, presentation. So uh, we had four presentations with, I think, some uh, fairly consistent messages, which is very interesting and encouraging. And also some uh, specificities and interesting uh, ideas in uh, each of these presentations. Uh, I was uh, impressed by uh, what uh, Mrs. Alvarez said, for example, on the institutional coordination and the creation of the, the Green Force in the, in the Philippines. Um, so I, I would like to encourage uh, all uh, participants to uh, ask their questions in the in the chat. I've seen that there are already a few questions. And uh, the, the first one is about uh, green budgeting and PFM not being a new concept. Uh, and the question is, uh, what can we learn from the many years of its existence uh, and, uh, and why it hasn't seen yet the level of adoption uh, commensurate with the challenges that we are facing in terms of uh, climate change? Um, I think this, uh, this question, maybe uh, Margot, you, Jan, you want to say a few words? Uh, I'll be happy to, to add something and uh, uh, Mr. Vijvira also maybe may uh, may want to add something. Margot, Jan, do you, do you want to comment on this? Yes, thank you both team. Maybe I will let the floor to Dion and I will have something later. Okay. Thank you very much, Delphine and, and Margot. Well, the, the question said that green budgeting was not a new concept. Uh, I think that I would tend to disagree with that. Uh, 
I think we can say that green green budgeting, perhaps as a concept, is not new, but it being applied in government is very new in most cases. Uh, so we have in government now uh, an emphasis, a great political push on green budgeting, on climate change, meeting the environmental challenges. So all of us are now essentially looking for the right institutional setup, the processes, the tools to implement this. So at least uh, from my experience in OECD countries, this is uh, this is very new, how to Im implement it in concrete terms, as opposed to perhaps the concept which has been with us for a while. OK, um, uh, yeah. sorry, you want to, to say yes. something, Margot? As Jan was mentioning, it's really new and the practice is evolving too. And we can see that countries are developing like new tools, new methods. So it's true that it's not like a new concept, but it's a new practice. Yes, I uh, I agree uh, to 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 add uh, to to this answer that uh, I think the political economy and the mindset has changed. I would say also that there is probably a better understanding because of all the work that has been done on fiscal risks in particular of the cost of this. I mean, beyond uh, the uh, international uh, treaties and commitments and uh, everything that is happening at the moment to make us realize that uh, climate change and environment considerations must be considered as priorities. Uh, probably in ministries of finance uh, because of uh, all the work that has been done on better understanding fiscal risks and uh, the cost of uh, climate change and natural disasters to uh, public finances, the sense of uh, uh, urgency and uh, relevance of this topic for the work on uh, fiscal planning and, and budgeting has, uh, has increased. I also fully agree that we have the tools now. We have the methodologies. Uh, there is also performance budgeting that has happened in many countries in the meantime and probably has changed the mindset about what budgeting is supposed to achieve. And uh, there are also technical, uh, technical improvements that are going to allow to do green budgeting much better. I'm thinking, for example, of some things such as a financial management information system that are allowing to do real tagging of expenditures. Uh, which was not the case in the past. Uh, I don't know whether other panelists, uh, Mrs. Uh, Alvarez uh, 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 and uh, Mr. Vigera want, want to add something. Yeah, just a quick thought, uh, Jaffin. Uh, one, one additional thing I could bring in is that we have done some uh, very uh, you know, strong analytical work uh, assessments on the fiscal aspects of not taking into account green uh, budgeting, green practices, where we have showed very conclusively in several countries uh, that not having a strong sustainability dimension in public finance decisions have huge repercussions down the line. For example, just the this issue about the agriculture policies, uh, which I mentioned earlier, some of the very unsustainable agriculture policies, particularly the heavy use of pesticides and inorganic fertilizers and all that, have created massive health crises in countries. Uh, the chronic kidney diseases and various other ailments, which are which are prevalent, very prevalent, and the government spending quite a colossal amount of money in, in tackling those issues. So, had that been uh, more sustainable, more green, and more sustainable practices into fiscal policy earlier, some of these five fighting expenditures that the countries are going through right now uh, can be quite significantly cut down to a great extent. And I believe that's also very strong in terms of the, uh, the debt uh, dynamics in countries, uh, because when, when the sustainable policies are not built into fiscal policies, it kind of leads into additional expenditures down the line, uh, which kind of makes uh, you know public sector borrow more, yeah, debt, debt burden increases. And one of the reasons why the countries, some of these countries we have analyzed also face with a uh, really large debt problem. So I think the sustainability dimension, the direction is very important. And that's why a lot of countries are now going into these great PFM environment, the sustainable PFM environments, uh, so that they're building sustainable policies so that they avoid firefighting in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, uh, I will very quickly give an answer to uh, the question on the IMF framework, uh, which is uh, 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 highlighting or mentioning that usually uh, the IMF financing framework is a complete package with monetary policy and uh, uh, other uh, policies. 
Uh, you, the question is uh, how green PFM integrates with the other IML frameworks. This is this question is uh, an opportunity for me to to underline again that there is really the policies formulation, which is something that is being discussed through the workshop in uh, in in different sessions. And then green PFM is about uh, implementation. Uh, there is a definition of uh, PFM that uh, uh, was proposed by an academic a few years ago, which is that PFM is what uh, fiscal policy works. So uh, the, the IMF indeed uh, as a framework uh, for uh, uh, climate change and uh, a number of papers, including a paper that I've shown during my presentation on, on fiscal policies and other uh, types of policies that, can help, that can help addressing uh, climate change, but then green PFM is a different topic. Uh, this is not about uh, which policies to, to favor. This is about creating the framework, the environment and the processes that are allowing to design and prioritize and fund the right uh, policies. Uh, again, uh, in my presentation, if you want to, uh, to to have more information on this, there is a link uh, to the green uh, PFM framework that was uh, defined by the IMF, where all these uh, implementation issues are discussed, and another link uh, to uh, an important uh, paper on fiscal policies for addressing climate change that was published uh, a few months ago, specifically discussing uh, the Asia and Pacific uh, region. We have now uh, uh, another question, uh, which is about uh, the uh, the fact that uh, integrating green PFM uh, systems into ministries of finance decision making uh, processes is important. But uh, the question is about what panelists think about the importance of transparency and accountability aspects of uh, such effort in the sense of uh, making the information accessible and, uh, and legible, and uh, whether this can uh, push government's action on climate, uh, nature and pollution. Uh, do any, does any panelists want to uh, answer this question? I, I can say a few words if uh, if nobody else is is uh, is joining. I mean, th I mean, this is this is absolutely fundamental that uh, that just saying that something is uh, is green, just saying that something is good for the climate, uh, putting that label on it is not enough. That you need to have the accountability and the transparency. That once you you dig in and you can see that those funds not only have the label, but they are actually achieving the purposes. That uh, that they were intended for. The green budgeting doesn't doesn't turn into sort of a, a marketing exercise, a, a greenwashing exercise, and uh, and that is a real danger. Uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, I can only uh, just support your your message. Um, Again, uh, uh, in the in the presentation about this green PFM framework that the IMF has developed, uh, that uh, I delivered at the beginning of the presentation, uh, what's really important is that indeed uh, green PFM is not only about the budgeting processes uh, of the Ministry of Finance itself, but it's a wider uh, uh, system uh, and it includes control and audit and. Uh, external uh, watchdogs have a role to play and they do already uh, play a role. Uh, this role can be uh, more systematic and uh, obviously uh, the, the quality of the information uh, that is disclosed by the government is going to be uh, very crucial in the future for giving credibility uh, to green PFM and uh, also to, to give uh, credibility to all the green uh, finance uh, initiatives. So uh, I expect that there will be actually uh, more and more push uh, under the impulse of the investors for transparency and the role of the external watchdog is going to become uh, increasingly important too. Any other uh, comment on this uh, important question? 
Uh, Daphne, I also think that there is a role for public oversight committees, uh, especially the role of the parliament in this. Uh, with those public finance committees in parliament, uh, which uh, scrutinizes public finance budgets of government, they also would have a responsibility kind of ensuring the greenness of our budgets. And I think that's also something that we probably need to uh, bring into the to uh, bring into the fore. Yes, absolutely. Um, I don't know if uh, Mrs. Uh, Paula. Alvarez is still with us. Do you want to say uh, something about the, the Philippines Committee on, uh, on Climate Change? Yes, OK, so for the Philippines Climate Change Commission, what we are actually doing now since with the advent of uh, green and sustainable finance, which is a new concept, for example, in the Philippines is we are working together with them since the there are the policy making body of the government. However, they do not cover financing, for example. So central banks still have a um, mandate over banks, for example, risk exposure, and you have other institutions, for example, like the Insurance Commission, which is supposed to look into the risk exposure. So it, it entails a lot of different government agencies. So now what we're doing is we're working with them since your climate change now is being uh, there's there's a new wave of how do you incorporate climate change in your monetary and fiscal policy so it's not just conserving the environment but what we're trying to look at is how do we minimize the risk exposure overall so i think this is where your budgeting tools and your other um uh, I think I saw a while ago that a presentation where we we're going to have a webinar on how the ministries of finance play a role in terms of climate change. And I think these are very important policy discussions that we need to also take into consideration. So uh, I, I hope that's enough for, for the question. Yes, thank you very much. That's uh, very uh, useful. Um, I think we are getting close from uh, the uh, end of uh, this session of the workshop. Uh, unless there is a final question popping up in the in the chat. Um, I would suggest that we close the session. Lynn, do, do you? Do you agree? Any final um, question on your side? <laughs> No, no, thank you. I just want to thank participants for their participation today. And I want to remind everyone that um, our next section, section three, will start at 10 a.m. Bangkok time tomorrow. And we look forward to your to seeing you again tomorrow. So let me thank also all participants and uh, our great uh, panelists for a really uh, interesting uh, discussion, which I hope is proving Green PFM is a uh, really a credible and important tool for everything that we are trying to achieve. And thank you very much. I look forward to the next sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye.